So, um, I wanted to introduce um, the three panelists, starting um, on my far right, Jeffrey Beattie. Jeffrey is a professor of psychology at Edge Hill University, um, and uh, he's got the Spearman Medal awarded by the British Psychological Society for published psychological research of outstanding merit. Um, and then he's also got something called the Mouton d'Or for the best research in semiotics, and I think that means the golden sheep. Is that right? I think it is. Um, uh, so he's written 24 non-fiction books, closely observing society in the north of England, particularly including uh, survivals of survivors of Steel City about uh, Sheffield, um, England After Dark, uh, On the Ropes, Boxing as a Way of Life, and his own memoir about growing up in a Protestant working class household during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, uh, which is called Protestant Boy. Um, so uh, you've got a new book just about to be published, haven't you? What's that called? Uh, the Body's Little Secrets. The Body's Little Secrets, a bit the closer. The Body's Little Secrets. There you go. Uh, about to be published. Um, you might also recognise uh, Geoffrey as the psychologist in the first uh, ten series of Big Brother. So then uh, next to Geoffrey is uh, Bernadette Tuza Ritter. Um, Bernadette works in uh, Budapest, and you, you come from Budapest, don't you? So Bern Bernadette uh, works in Budapest in Hungary, and uh, A Woman Captured is her debut feature-length documentary, um, which uh, has already been shown at the festival. When's it being shown again? When's the next screen? Oh, on the 11th. On the 11th, so being screened again on Monday. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so um, Bernadette's also worked as an editor on documentaries and also as an editor and script supervisor in the cinema. And then on my left, um, Sean McAllister. Um, Sean's been making films um, after graduating from the NFTS for nigh on 20 years. Uh, and some of, some of the film titles I include uh, Just People. This is going from the beginning, Just People. Um, the Minders, Hull's Angels, uh, The Liberace of Baghdad, uh, Japan, A Story of Love and Hate, A Syrian Love Story, and his new film, um, which opened Sheffield Up Fest um, amazingly well on Thursday, is called The Northern Soul. Um, so I hope many of you saw it on um, the opening night, or perhaps you were at the party uh, afterwards where um, Steve Arnott, um, the protagonist in the film, um, and his Beats bus crew basically took over the, the DJ booth and the dance floor, which was pretty amazing. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that we'll have Steve um, joining us um, later in the session just to give his perspective. So I'm going to start by asking each of you um, for a sort of quick one-liner, actually. Um, uh, if you can sum up the way you, as a um, filmmaker, or in your case, Jeffrey, as a psychologist, how you engage with the people in your work. Um, so, Bernadette, if you can try and sum that up for me. What, what do, when, you, when, when, you, when you're making a film, or making this film, what, what's going through your head? What's the, what's, how would you sum that up for the audience? Uh, when I was making this film, um, I, First, I had a visual concept that I, I, I want to observe one face. I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to, to do anything, just to observe. And uh, this was how I started to, to, look, to observe her emotions. And uh, I asked her not to look into my camera. Uh, but then I saw that life is different. I mean, I have to turn from a filmmaker to human, and I have to interact with my character, which, which, which is actually against the documentary filmmaking rules that you should be an observer. So this was how I started to be, in, be engaged, and I always started the project, and it turned. Great, thank you. And, and Sean, how about you? I'm, when, uh, when Luke introduced you, Luke Moody introduced you um, uh, on Thursday, he said, your films, um, your films are, are really all relationships. Is that the way you see, that, see it as well? Um, I, I've always spent a long time looking for people, the right people to film, so I find a subject that interests me and then spend up to a year looking for the right person to fill that, to tell that story, so it's somehow the micro telling the macro story. Um, 
And in doing that, I try to find someone that I can build that relationship with. And part of the film, part of the unfolding narrative for the audience is the forming of that relationship on, 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 on screen. And, and what develops in a non-verbal sense is, is filmed and allowed for them to read and understand. And, and, then, and, and that becomes part of the story for me. Okay, and, and Jeffrey, maybe maybe starting with your with the, the, the books that I was mentioning earlier, you also you also have a if you like a documentary methodology, um, uh, even though you're coming from a maybe a different perspective than than, uh, than Bernadette and Sean. Well, well, the kind of documentary books I've written are very different from from into what the, into the from from what I've been from the, the two films that we're kind of discussing today because I, I was really struck by the connectedness between the Bernadette and Sean and, and the people they were writing about. And, and from a psychology point of view, what was fascinating was watching those relationships develop and change over time. Uh, in Bernadette's case, I mean, it, it, to me, it was a masterclass, really, in, in the, the building of trust. Uh, I've just said to her before we came on, I think she, she's not just a masterful filmmaker, she's a masterful psychologist. Because to take someone who's clearly suffering from a kind of learned helplessness and change that was extraordinary. But, um, so, so going back to, to your work, when you've been, I mean, maybe looking back to, to um, stories of Steel City on Sheffield, um, when you were doing that, how, uh, were, you, were you conscious of, of, of documenting people's lives or were you, were you trying to say use them to say something that you wanted to say? Well, well the kind of theme of uh, Survivors of Steel City was it was done during the um, late 70s and early 1980s, you know, as a time of kind of uh, enormous change in the city. And I suppose what I wanted to do was I, I, I was working as an academic psychologist and academic psychologists spent a lot of time talking about the statistics of unemployment and the psychological impact of unemployment. And I thought in all of the academic work I read, there was no concept of what a person was like or what they were going through mm. or what they were experiencing. So that book was a deliberate attempt to break free of my academic background and to spend time with the individuals um, and to get to know them. And the relationships, just as uh, uh, Bernard and Sean spent some time with both Steve and um, Marish, developed over many, many years. I mean, 10 years, 15 years. 15 years later, I was getting... Uh, letters from prison saying, would I please send a copy of the book in and <laughs> like, please talk to X about Y. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I realized that my commitment to these individuals didn't stop when, when the book was published. Uh, and people drew upon um, any attributes I had. For example, one of the individuals I wrote about in Steel City ap applied for a job in the probation service in Sheffield. And um, he said, you write, could you help me write the application? And he, he didn't get the uh, job, but, he, but apparently they said it was one of the best written applications they'd ever received. <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of realized what I, what I could do for individuals, um, and, 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 and they drew upon it over, over a very long period of time. Okay. Um, so it, you, you, you mentioned a little bit just then about, um, uh, about the experience of seeing Bernadette's film. Step, step, t take one step back. Um, we have a room full of, of documentary filmmakers. Um, from your perspective as a psychologist, and, and this panel is about psychology in a way, so do you believe that documentary filmmakers have enough understanding or training in psychology and the ways, the impact of what we're um, all doing, what you're all doing um, on the subjects? And then I'd really love to hear Bernadette and, and Sean's um, view on that. Well, it was fascinating watching the interaction in action because it, it clearly starts with Marish and Bernadette not having much interaction. You know, Bernadette's doing a particular style of documentary where you just watch the individual. Marish, of course, is very expressive and in some psychological distress throughout most of the film. But we'll we'll look at a clip later, but it, I, I mean, in sort of broader terms, do you think it's it's something that we need to learn? more about? I, I think psychology is absolutely critical to the craft but as I say from from my point of view what was really interesting seeing was, was seeing how psychology was already being marshaled mm. in not necessarily an academic form but in, in a form to, to make the stuff work. In, in Sean's case it was a psychology of hope and aspiration and also quite a lot of kind of if, if I can say so kind of lay psychology about the theme of parenthood 
and what it is to bring children up with a ray of hope and so on. And there was quite a lot of psychologizing in there. Steve talked about his relationship with his own father and the implication that had on his life. So, and, and I, I suppose w what I was really interested in then was h how the implications for the future of both of that, because I think both of them for me as a psychologist set up a dilemma about the way things might develop subsequently. And I suppose that's where I was kind of watching very carefully to, to look at some mm. issues. All right. Look, I think what we'll, what we'll do now, let's, let's um, look at the first um, clip. And we'll, I think, because then that, that will give us all a, 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 for those of you who haven't seen Bernadette's um, film yet, that'll give us a better sense um, of, of the particular style. And then we can talk some more about it. So um, uh, I think you've already ex explained, um, have you explained how you came to make the film? No, I'm not sure you have. Do you want to just do that and then we'll play the clip? How did you come to make the film? It was a, um, a film school project, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I started as a totally different project. I applied to the Hungarian Film School to study directing and uh, I had to make a five minutes short about a day of a person, any person. And I had this uh, visual concept that I only want to observe one face. I want to show uh, a day through emotions. And, uh, and I, I met Marish a few years earlier and I could remember her face because she looked so much older. She was only around 50 but look, looked like 70. So I thought, oh, this might be a good face to show a day. Uh, and I started to shoot, and, uh, and during these days of shooting, she told me that she's not paid. So this was how my, my topic Great. turned to... So, so it became a film. So can we play the first uh, of Bernadette's clips, please? There's a very intense um, relationship be between the two of you. Um, at, at what point do you think um, uh, Marish felt that she could trust you? Uh, I, I think this, this happened step by step. Um, it, was, it was not so difficult because uh, all what I did was to focus on her emotions and to tune into her soul to always that she should always feel comfortable in my presence within my company so uh, i asked her at the beginning not to look into the camera this is my only ask i please don't look into my camera and i felt that she she wants to look into my camera so i let her to do that and, uh, and uh, then she started to trust me step by step. At, at the beginning, I never asked her anything because I thought, of course, I was really interested in her story, but I felt she feels really ashamed to talk about that. And I knew that the victims usually worry that, that people will blame them, that they became victims. So I never asked anything. Uh, but in the same time, I had to think, what the audience wants to know. So I should raise the questions what the audience mm. wants to know. So when I felt she starts to open, I started to ask more and more questions. But I, I was always aware that she should feel comfortable with that. Okay. And, and Jeffrey, then how did, how, when you see that clip, um, try and deconstruct it, if you like, from a psychologist's perspective what do you think what do you, when you see that what do you think is going on in the filmmaker and uh, the relationship between the two well the, the thing that strikes you about the film really is, is the very slow building of the relationship um, it really is a kind of case study of learned helplessness because Marisha has been kind of isolated psychologically isolated in that household uh, and punished no matter what she does and we know that learned helplessness is a difficult issue from a psycho psychological point of view to do anything about so what Bernadette's doing is, is building a kind of an, an alliance with her, a kind of, if you don't mind saying, a therapeutic alliance, because you're having to deal with her emotional state and, and reassure her. I'm struck by the self-talk that Marish does, and I'm sure that wasn't just done for the camera, because I think people self-talk like that when they're trying to reassure themselves. If you've no one else to speak to, you're kind of planning your actions and reinforcing yourself by, by, by doing that kind of talk. You know, we're always kind of put off by people that we see self-talking in public, but sometimes, it's, unfortunately, it's necessary. 
So I was fascinated by, by this, this building of trust, this building of an alliance, and also with the fact that Marish was, you know, by saying, don't mention this to Etta and so on, you know, the, the whole point about a relationship with three people is that you know, we have to form alliances within that group. And she needed to be reassured that you were on her side and not on anyone else's side. And I saw a lot of that throughout the film, this kind of building of seeing how, how much she could trust you. And in some sense, she was testing you by seeing what she could uh, accept and what she couldn't accept. Because I think if, if you're someone who's been psychologically traumatized, as Marish clearly has, then you don't take things at face value. You, when the documentary filmmaker turns up with the best of intentions, you're always going to be somewhat suspicious. And of course, there is a, a kind of moral and intellectual dilemma anyway, isn't there? Because with a documentary film, for film you're making, there's always a product at the end of it. Uh, Interesting, and, and, and that sets up this business of the interpretation of motive. And I think she was very interested in, in testing what your motive was and seeing whether it operated at one level or a different level and to what extent at some point you may involve Etta in the whole issue. Uh, so it, it was fascinating to watch because she was doing it cautiously, you know, like a, like a deer in a you know, hunter's sights or something, you know, tentative steps to see to see what reaction she could get from you. And I was fu one, of, one of the things I happen to work on academically, by the way, is eye gaze. I, I study eye gaze for a living. I, I track people to see where they're looking. And again, it was fascinating seeing not just when she looked at the camera, but when she was clearly looking at you to try, to, to try and test you. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll come back to, to um, the film. But I now want to turn to Sean here. As I say, many of us will have seen um, the film The Northern Soul um, on Thursday, um, which explores the, the life and the, the Beats Bus um, uh, project of uh, Steve Arnott. And um, uh, it, was, it, it takes place over the, the year and a bit of uh, Hull City of Culture, um, which has now come to an end, hasn't it, um, Sean? Well, officially not. Ah, not yet. So not until Coventry kicks in in three more years. Ah, okay. So it's a long, it's a long year. But the streets are quiet, let's just put it that way. So um, tell us, Sean, about... I mean, I, I, I named some of the films earlier, um, but tell us a, a bit more about your method. Um, you, you mentioned that earlier, but about looking for, for people who represented a subject that you're interested in. Um, Maybe then tell us about what drew us, drew you to, to Steve and how you met him. I, um, when I'm looking for a film, I'm also looking for somebody that's interested in being in a film and looking for, for someone that's actively um, looking for something, I guess, themselves. And um, Because I think the motives are interesting, why we want to make films, but then why do people want to be in films? Mm. It's, it's a really interesting... See, uh, and often that ex that's what you were saying about what happens when you film somebody, what happens when you take somebody on a journey, what happens next is what interests me. Uh, and if possible, to try to create that into the third act of the film so that part of the process becomes mm. this surprise in the story, which happened with Steve, which happened two weeks before we finished editing. Um, for me, I didn't realize, I didn't really think he would have the strength or the risk or the, the, the very big danger in walking away from his job but he'd gone through a journey with the film and I think it had opened up a, so many corridors of hope and it had taken him on a journey into himself and, a, and, I, think, and I think the exposure of the film without being you know, I think he knew the film was coming here and he thought opportunities were going to open up as well and he took a risk so I'm interested in actually making things change for people when I make films as well. I'm not just interested in going in and stealing and taking. I was never comfortable with winning the trust and access of somebody going to make something and then running away and sharing it at a crazy festival with crazy people that come and watch documentaries. Mm -hmm. Far more crazy than the people in them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it might be good to see, um, to see Steve now. Do you want to set up the the clip you brought along. He's currently stuck on the motorway trying to get here back from Hull because it was his mother's 60th birthday yeah. last night. And so we're, we're hoping Steve... He's just on the phone now, hold on. Is he? <laughs> <I was> just <laughs> calling. <laughs> Hello? 
All right, Steve, you're, you're here. Yeah, we're here. Well, can you hurry up? Because they're all waiting for you. <laughs> Nothing like keeping people waiting. Those tense moments. He knows, he knows the things about filmmaking. I keep them waiting. <laughs> He's swearing at me now. You told me fucking 10.30. <laughs> so it's all about relationships, filmmaking. <laughs> Well, just fucking hurry up, because we're showing the clip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on the second, first floor, I think. The town hall. Yeah. Okay, shall we show the clip? Yeah, not the, not the city hall where he was. Not before. the city hall, the town hall. The town hall, yeah. Yeah, the big, yeah. The big Victorian building. It's the big building. <laughs> <laughs> the okay, shall we play the clip, and he's just going to come up. It's just parking. Brilliant. Lovely. Okay, yeah, so that's, uh, let's play the clip. So that's a very um, raw moment of um, confession, really, and that comes quite, uh, I think it's about halfway through the film, isn't it? Mm. Um, and probably halfway through the, the year of, you know, the year of you uh, getting to know each other. Um, did, did you feel that that um, that Steve was con confessing things to you? Did, did, did he feel that he was talking to you in a way that he wouldn't talk to other people? I knew it was a moment when he didn't want to be filmed because he wanted to go immediately home from work that shift, and I was trying to catch him at moments that wasn't when he just got home and and when he was settled. It was for me. It's all about catching mo catching people in moments when the if you like, slightly off the guard, so that those things happen, because he, want, he wants to try to control elements of how he conveys his life to me, but I know things are sli slightly starting to fall out of kilter for him. So for me, it's a matter of just catching him as he's going between stopping to get a packet of fags as he's coming out of the factory, where you can just get him under it. Uh, and so it just happened under a street light. I never expected that outburst. I knew stuff was going on. But I knew if we'd have got back home, if he'd have taken his jacket off, he'd have made a cup of tea, he'd have composed himself and he'd have prepared himself to convey something. And I didn't want him to unpack all of that. I wanted to catch that moment that was still fermenting in his head as he was kind of coming out. And, and then we can start to witness that you allow the audience to then unravel and read into so much more than having somebody reflect almost and have that preparation in, in unpacking shit. And, 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 and I'm not really interested at that point. I want to be three steps before that when he's not kind of gone through that process. Um, at, at the opening session, as I say, I hope when, once he's parked his car, he'll, he'll be able to, um, uh, to, to tell you what he meant by this, tell us what he meant by this. But um, I think uh, somebody asked, "Are you? Uh, what, what did you expect from him when you started the process, and what did he expect from you?" Um, uh, maybe just talk about what you expected from him. Well, I wanted to make a film as a former factory worker in Hull, myself that had left to go on to make films before City of Culture. I'd wanted to go back to look at the landscape of where, where we'd arrived at with, in Britain today, so to look at in-work poverty, to look at all of the issues that surround Steve. So I wanted to make a film about that, really. So in doing that, you're looking for someone that's an articulate representation of, for me, the working class, which is a lot of what television has degraded, really, with benefits, Britain, and all of that trash that comes from Channel 5 and, and, and garbage channels. That, 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 undigni that show undignified representations of people. So I spent a lot of time looking to find a dignified representative. So for me, regardless of City of Culture, regardless of his Beach Bus, he was a really interesting character for me to study, to look at as somebody that, that was trapped, that had so many more capabilities, that represented so many people in the country that are stuck in shit jobs, that are, that are eating away at them because they have so much more possibilities inside them but because of stuff that they've done they're in an economic trap they can't leave so that's really fundamentally what i was interested in in, in steve so jeffrey when you you've seen the film the whole film now and then then looking at that um clip um uh un unpick that relationship as you as you see it and uh uh 
uh, Sean's way as a filmmaker of um, getting through to that, getting, you know, portraying that relationship on screen and that character? Well, first of all, it's a fascinating clip uh, for one very simple reason, which is it tells us something about the psychology of that kind of position on the economic framework. Uh, there's, you know, again, speaking from an academic psychology point of view, we, we claim that we know a lot about what the psychological aspects of being in debt and in a crap job and so on are. But you're absolutely right. That's when people are being reflective and you're asking them under certain conditions to tell us what they think. What you have managed to do there is to see the, the dark, I mean, literally the darker side of that, which is the kind of what is the automatic emotional response to that kind of thing like. And, and I mean, one fascinating thing here is what documentary can tell us about psychology rather than vice versa, because I thought that was a real insight into what this, you know, I felt that I knew much more about Steve's situation, psychological situation, having seen that clip, because sometimes he kept himself up, but there, sorry, I don't want to use the cliched metaphor, the mask slips, but it was a different side of him came out at that point. And, and obviously what the film is about is, is about the psychology of hope. You know, what is it, if, if, if we don't live in, <laughs> here he comes, the, the, the situation where people don't have hope, uh, and you know, if you have potential, what is it to not see that potential realized? And, and it seemed to me that the whole film w w was about that psychological aspect of, of giving people, giving Steve that possibility of, of change and being someone different. And, 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 and as I say, what was interesting was there was a, a lot of background stuff about, about why Steve might have been in that, I don't mean economic position, but general psychological position in the first place, you know, which, um, you know, in terms of his relationship with his, with his dad and so on. Um, and I suppose that the only thing I wanted to ask about was that having made the film, uh, does that assist, the, I mean, notwithstanding the point about exposure, does that assist the process or do you think that necessarily if, a, if your documentary is trying to be true that inevitably you're going to make certain aspects a bit tougher in the future? I just wondered about Steve's relationship with his father post-film. Hmm. I don't know if you have any comment on that. Um, uh, Steve, Steve just sat down and says, Steve, just to let you know where we're, <laughs> where we're up to, we've just... Um, <laughs> we're talking about you. <laughs> we're talking about you. So, so we've been... We, it's all right. Welcome. Welcome. And um, all these lot are really curious about you. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think... Exactly. And I think um, uh, what we've been talking about is, um, uh, you know, we're curious about w what it was like, really, to be filmed and to talk to um, Sean, who you hadn't met before meeting him, to talk to him um, about your life and what you were going through in the particular moment um, that we saw there, which, just sum it up, Sean? Which was the scene when you were coming out of the, uh, of the factory gates with the feeling of, you know, doing all what you'd done with the bus and then getting the news that you'd been demoted in the job and, and then I think you wanted to go home and we stopped for a, for a fag break and it was just under that lampshade and it was, um, it was that scene where you re reflected on, on being 42 and having fuck all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember that one, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's just been, it's been a mad, like, year and a half. It, the ups and downs have just been crazy and... There was points where I just wanted to give up and just say, Do you know what, I'm, I'm stretching myself, I'm, I'm working really hard, and I just want, I, I did at the points just want to give up and just go back to being the normal warehouse worker and just working for a living, doing my job and not worrying about anything else. But Sean was definitely inspiring to me. He, he, he kept pushing me along and, you know, it was really inspiring. And these guys as well, like the guys who worked on my team, massively positive all the time. And, and just keep pushing me and keep pushing me. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I had nothing because there's a lot of people in the world that are a lot worse off than I am. But that, at that point, it felt, it felt, it felt, I, I felt empty, a bit empty and stuff. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was difficult, really difficult. I mean, I think you said the process of hope, if the film can do anything, and that journey for the participant is isn't that you're stealing from them, 
but they've they've got an energy from the pr from the so it is a hopeful process that the feeling that's taking them along we're not just reveling in seeing the moments of being down it's it's a it's a journey of hope that the that is hopefully going to take them somewhere yeah. and, and and you were fairly instrumental in the change you, did you, you kind of suggested it didn't you that that steve might might go it alone and might a few times a few times yeah to be honest it was my when I met him, yeah. it was my, you know, because I'd been trapped as well, and I could see when he pushed this idea in my hand and he wanted to be filmed, the subliminal message for there was, yes. I want my fucking life to change, but to I'm, change, I'm yeah. not brave enough to do it. Come yeah. and film me. That's the way I read it. He ne we never spoke about it, and then as the year went on, yeah. for me, it became more and more clear. But right. And what was your emotional come back from all of that i mean do you, i mean obviously it's wonderful to see people set off on a journey and it's wonderful to to have a goal and to, and to reach it but do you have any fear as well about the whole thing any anxiety do you have conflicted emotions about the whole thing when he left i was yeah breaking it yeah i mean you know what can you, you there's no guarantees are there but but yeah. also there's there's a point to you where there's where he'd reached emotionally where he couldn't stay. And Yaz, his, his partner, was saying to him, listen, I've never seen you more miserable. You can't get up anymore. Right. Get the fuck out of there. And did, did, you, did you talk to... Did you say to Sean, well, I'm going to do it. I'm thinking of doing it. What do you think? Or did yeah, you just yeah. do it? No, I, I, I said to Sean first, like, what do you think about this for an ending to the film? <laughs> 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 so... <laughs> but, yeah, then, then we talked about it and... I've I've always I've always had a job I've always had a regular income so that that was a scary part of it for me to walk away and know that you're not going to get any money next month it was it was real scary so that was that was the hardest the hardest part of the decision okay. um, Sean definitely pushed me along to okay. do it excellent uh, thanks very much Steve um, uh, I want to turn back to to Bernadette now um, uh, who's made a film. Just to, so, that, so that you know, she's made a film um, called A Woman Captured, which is about, a, um, would you call it somebody caught in modern slavery um, as, a, as a domestic servant who doesn't seem to have uh, any rights at all in her home. Um, and you as well had a, a, let's say, a role to play in how her life changed, didn't it? Um, and maybe without giving too much away about the ending of the film, um, because uh, just to remind you, it's being shown on uh, on Monday. Um, do you want to talk a bit about how, how your what your um, uh, what, what your role was, or how your relationship changed, if it did, if indeed it did change, in that second half of the film? Uh, yeah, well, uh, how I got the trust, I, I think, on both sides, or, or even on, on Marie's side and on the side of the captors, was that I, I never wanted to pretend that I on, I'm only interested in their story. I arrived with my camera at the very first moment, and I always had the camera in my hand, and I told them clearly that I'm here only to make a film, uh, because what we usually do is that we we are we have some meetings we we become friends and then we start to shoot but i i I was shooting from the very first moment and I think this really helped to to get closer and to trust me and uh and when I felt that Marish is starting to trust me then i i I tried to remind her to her free life, that she's born to be free, that she's a lovely person, and I, and I never offered my help. I just wanted to remind her that she's really lovely and I think she, she, she could live on her own because she's strong enough. And, and I think this gave her the courage to, to run away because from the moment when I arrived with my camera, she was not alone anymore. She had a friend and I tried to focus on that and I asked her to tell me if she doesn't want to be filmed, I, I will stop it immediately. Uh, this was really important for me and I think this helped to get closer to each other because she felt so safe in my company. And uh, I think we've, we've just about got enough time to see the second clip, which I think shows, um, a, again, both the pressures she's under, the huge pressures she's under, um, 
and also uh, how she responds to you. So can we play the second of Bernadette's clips now, please? And in a way, that's the, the lowest point of the film, I think, um, as I remember. After that, as you say, she, she gets the, um, the, the courage. And do you think it was the, if you like, the act of being filmed that gave her the courage to leave? Um, yeah, but uh, the fact that she has a friend mm. and, uh, and of course at some point she realized that she wants to show to the world that she's strong enough to do it. I think that was really important. And uh, from this clip, uh, so I never show the face of the evil, of the captors. I only show hands <laughs> and I, I only, you can listen to their voice and you see shadows, but you never see the face, uh, which was important for me because it's not about that woman, it's about someone in general. And um, I was, uh, it was really interesting for me how to build up the character of the evil without showing the face. Mm. And what I did that I was uh, I was watching cartoons with it because there are cartoons when you see that the evil uh, you, you you can't see the evil's face so you Im imagine something much worse. Uh, so this is what this is what I try to do to to make something similar uh, in my film. Okay, um, and and Jeffrey maybe just to to sum it up before we have time for a couple of questions. Um, how do you see the, the sort of similarities and differences maybe between the two filmmaking approaches? And what can we, you know, what can everybody in the room take from it in, in, in their own filmmaking, do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, th I think both films uh, are, are about psychological relationships. I think what's fascinating in the clip we've just seen, really, is I think there are a number of aspects of that. I think uh, as a case study in terms of emotional expression of despair, it's very interesting, and of course, what's really fascinating is that Marish has no control. She's no control over what happens to her. She's no control over how she interprets her own emotional state. Mm -hmm. So that to me, that was fascinating when someone says, you're looking like this and that because you're angry. I'm sorry, so in terms of how did she manage to break free, there were two aspects to it. I think, first of all, it was not just the friend, but the, th the therapeutic alliance. And the fact that Bernadette, you gave her some control again over her life, that she can stand up whenever she wants to. So I think that issue of interpersonal control was critical. But also, of course, that this off-camera voice had been documented. You know, for the first time, people would say, so this is the kind of inhumanity that some people suffer on a daily basis. So I think that was critical. I think in, in Sean's case, it was about the psychology of of kind of hope and aspiration and this notion of, of a friend who could kind of guide you, almost like a mentor actually, I thought of that almost as a, as a relationship, a, a mentor who could guide you through some you know, difficult times ahead, who could, who could show you the kind of way really. Um, and and in, of course both films are incredibly emotionally engaging for that reason. In, in A Woman Captured, I kept shouting at the TV, go, 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 and with, uh, um, with Steve, I kept thinking, oh, no, don't go, Steve. Think more carefully. Think more carefully. So it's... Uh, uh, <laughs> but I'm a cautious person. <laughs> uh, so, but, but, but again, fascinating in terms of, of different kinds of relationships leading people on very different journeys. Great. Well, look, we, we've um, uh, nearly come to the end, um, but I do want to leave um, time for a, uh, a couple of questions. If there are any questions in the room, there are volunteers with mics. I can see lots of questions. So I'm going to do my best to take um, three or four of them. The first, the gentleman at the back who um, has, the, has his hand up there in the middle. There's a gentleman in the back. There's a lady here. Yeah, first the gent at the back. He had his hand up first then, and then we'll have the lady in the front. Age-old microphone problem. No, I think Hello? Should, yeah. Oh, it's working. Um, yeah, just a quick question uh, for Bernadette. Um, uh, I can't see you. Where are you? Um, there. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, th that was, I mean, I was absolutely astonished how you managed to get her captor, tormentor, to agree to, the, uh, to be on this, uh, in this project, in this film. And so you also obviously had to work on gaining her trust. Um, how did you do that? Because that's also equally 
as vital as working with your your protagonist, your 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 main character. Yeah, when I when I entered that house, I, I had to accept all the rules of Etta. This was very clear. If I enter someone's house, I have to accept the rules. So and in the same time, which was that I, I will never show her face. And and I always uh, screened her the footage that she, she can be sure I, I she can trust me. Of course, she thought that I'm, I'm making a film for my school about the day of a person. And, and she thought that I'm a stupid young student. And I knew that. And it was important to keep her thinking that. Because I was, I was always one step ahead. Because she thought I'm stupid. Of course, in the same time, we had to be good friends. I had many conversations with Atta, listening to her stories. But uh, I, I told her that you are the bad guy in my film and Morish is the good guy, just to be prepared for the release of the film. Uh, and for Marish, it was, and, and I was really proud of having servants. And uh, uh, she was, it was a bit cool to shoot in her house, I mean for her. So, and she didn't think that she did anything wrong. Mm. I, in the film, she tells me that she, she thinks that there is nothing wrong with that. So this was at the side. On Marisha's side, I, I really tried to, to focus on her emotions and, and to, that she should feel comfortable with my presence. Actually, the only thing I d did was that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we'll take one at the front here and then uh, maybe one more after that. So. Um, I just, I just have a question. There's a question about... Sorry. Sorry. It is on. I don't think you have to do anything. Yes. Very About good. technology, whether either of you can answer the question of whether technology ever gets in the way of this very special relationship that you've both described. Because hmm. obviously a camera hmm. is not present in a therapeutic environment. Hmm. And between friends, there is no camera, generally, when you talk about things. So I just wonder whether how you negotiate that. Steve, do you want to, um, sorry, um, Sean, do you want to talk to that? I try to just film as small and as, as easily accessible as possible. It's but not really that you don't want them to feel that they're filming because it's always a film. The reason you're there is that you're making a film. So you're never pretending that you, I'm never pretending I'm not making a film. But then just being easy, just having something that's quick and accessible and easy to film. So something that's, that's as easy to get as my glasses now to be filming, to not have a crew, to not have all of that rigmarole, to just have something that can, 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 ca can catch moments as moments, moments happen, really. So I, I'm I, I would like to add yeah. some, can I? Yeah, this, this was the reason why I, I, I completely agree with you, and this was the reason why I arrived with my camera, and the camera was always in my hand. I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was making shots of the water, if, if not of her face. And, I, and after a while, she got used to it so much that once, when I didn't have the camera in my hand, she asked me, where is my camera? So it, it <laughs> totally turned. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm afraid we have to finish it now because we're getting on to the next session. I'm, I'm terribly sorry we didn't get to um, more questions. But uh, can I have a round of applause for, for Bernadette, for, Sean, for uh, Jeffrey, and for Steve? And thank you very much, Steve, for coming. Yeah.